Theory is History by Jairus Banaji. Chapter 11 Trajectories of Accumulation or Transitions to Capitalism. The late 19th century was the watershed of agrarian capitalism, the first age of discernib discernibly modern forms of agriculture and their rapid evolution. Founded in 1866 by a group of powerful progressive landowners, this, the Sociedad Rural Argentina would see its membership expand some two decades later. The rapid transformation of livestock farming in the 1880s was dominated by powerful estancieros and made Argentina's landowners the most prestigious and dynamic sector of the Argentine bourgeoisie. By the turn of the century, the Pampian Estancia had become the most efficient meat-producing enterprise in the world. Because rural wages in the Pampas were the highest in Latin America, Argentine landowners were compelled to use labor more efficiently than any other Latin American rural employers. The typical big Estancias could comprise several thousand hectares, but employ no more than a few dozen laborers. In Ferrara, the vast reclamation schemes of the 1870s and 1880s and the involvement of limited companies aiming at the exploitation of enormous tracts of land were the symbols of this burgeoning capitalism. The estates formed out of these schemes were divided into huge blocks of several hundred hectares each and worked mainly by gangs of casual laborers drawn from the massified labor forces of Emilia and the lower Po Valley. The specialized intensive horticulture that emerged in California in the 1880s and 1890s created a different kind of countryside, but one based, like the Emilian estates, on the low-wage mobility of impoverished migrant workers. As this orchard capitalism engendered a radical simplification of landscapes, it brought about an explosion of insect populations and a whole network of scientists agencies and industries sprang up to rescue fruit growing from the effects of its own expansion. And in Cuba, the turn of the century paved the way for the restructuring of the Cuban sugar industry as the older mills, known as ingenios, were dismantled and replaced by modern large-scale central factories, known in Cuba as centrales. The large-scale sugar factories that emerged in the aftermath of the Cuban War of Independence exploited economies of scale and were financed largely by North American capital. By 1927, North American companies controlled about three-quarters of the Cuban sugar, sugar crop. These were among the most advanced forms of capitalist agriculture, circa 1900, heavily capitalized enterprises owned by the biggest landowners and by banks and companies that used substantial volumes of migrant labor or even dispensed with labor to a very large degree. But the agricultural watershed of the late 19th century had been preceded by more sporadic and gradual histories of capitalism in the countryside. For example, for most of the 19th century itself, both Prussia and Southern Italy embodied forms of agrarian capitalism dominated by the aristocracies. And in Tuscany, where the nobilta remained strong, capitalism had to struggle to emerge against the, backdrop, the background of inherited relationships. Their landowners had to break down traditional forms of sharecropping and undermine the sharecroppers' resistance to crops that required heavier outlays of capital. This they achieved through tightening of contracts, drastic reductions in the average size of farms, and the creation of new categories of semi-proletarianized misadry, who commuted to the land from neighboring villages or farm laborers' barracks. In other words, in other words, uh, damn. the commercialization of Tuscan agriculture followed a course radically different from the classical pattern of the Po Valley. Frank Snowden suggested that Tuscan landowners, for political reasons, opposed the Emilian idea of restructuring the countryside through the establishment of large commercial farms worked by wage labor. Whatever the truth of this, it remains true that agrarian capitalism could, could and did take radically different forms, even within individual countries.
The entrenched orthodoxy that England's history supplies us with an archetype of capitalist agriculture is a myth. It is much less credible today as historians begin to map the very different ways in which capitalism evolved in agriculture and continues to do so. There is no pure agrarian capitalism. The advanced forms of agrarian capitalism that emerged in the late 19th century can make a head start on the rapid expansion of new tracts of land and expanding internal frontier. In Cuba, this included the eastern provinces, which became the preserve of the largest mills on the island. However, Jan Bizant's sem seminal contribution that the Mexican haciendas were essentially capitalist enterprises, radically different from the ensomiendas that had preceded them, even if characterized often and in practice by feudal survivals, takes us back to a much earlier culture of agrarian capitalism, one that had evolved one that had evolved in the 17th and 18th centuries against the background of labor practices that had been overtly coercive. That background had cast its shadow on the hacienda. Hence the reference to survivals. Bazant's paper had avoided the issue of labor and simply noted in passing that Zavala had characterized the hacienda as an enterprise based on wage labor. In fact, the beauty of Zavala's analysis was that it avoided any reference to a language of survivals. In any case, both papers, Zavala's published in 1944 and that of Bazant from the 50s, converged around the image of the Hacienda as an institution that had little or nothing to do with feudal feudalism per se. But if the Hacienda was emblematic of a kind of capitalism that was more typical of the 17th, 18th, and early 19th centuries, there's scarcely any clarity about what kind precisely. Is it possible to describe these early forms of agrarian capitalism in ways that avoid the teleological charge of a transition? If the more modern rural businesses that emerged in the late 19th century were characterized by their massive use of migrant workers, the haciendas had always operated with a core labor force of permanent workers and estates would often seek to control that permanence by methods reminiscent of bondage. The workers typically were, uh, were neither free in the sense in which most industrial workers in the 20th century were free, nor unfree in the sense of being purely bonded laborers. This suggests that we might try locating at least one general feature of these early forms of capitalism in their hybridity. This was a capitalism where the capitalists were often drawn from the, from the nobility and where production was often based on and shaped by asymmetric labor contracts. For example, estates might use credit wage advances to attract workers, but various forms of compulsion to retain them. Operations could be structured to maximize profitability but profits from the estate or the enterprise as a whole could underwrite a purely aristocratic lifestyle in cities like Naples. The hybridity of these forms has rarely been explored systematically. Um, Petrusowitz is an exception, although it is so obvious that it tends to polarize scholars, especially on the left, into defending manifestly one-sided positions. The more general point here is that a more solid taxonomy of the works or of the forms of capitalism and agriculture would have to range more widely than Lenin's essentially political contrast between landlord and peasant dominated trajectories. It would have to include the general forms of labor used, e.g. the slave based agricultural capitalism of the Old South, the specific labor systems under which workers were deployed, the circumstances in which large private estates emerged or consolidated at various times in, say, the later 18th and 19th centuries, including the land management policies that defined the context within which large landowners worked and the kinds and amount of finance available to them and the backgrounds from which they themselves emerged. And finally, the kinds of microecologies within which estates functioned, which were obviously bound up with the crops they grew these are all basic variables in any passably comprehensive study of the landscapes of agricultural capitalism. In this chapter, however, I shall look strictly at one dimension, namely labor or the nature of the workforce. 
that is, the particular ways in which capital integrated and transformed peasant labor, which itself had a lot to do with the labor market. The abundance or scarcity of labor, as well as the socially determined resistance to wage work. At this level, the most useful distinction to start from is between systems that functioned in terms of regular access to family labor and those that depended primarily on the massive seasonal deployment of a casual labor force that was predominantly male or female, but rarely mixed. Frank Snowden's brilliant description of the Apulian Latifundia illustrates one form of the casual labor model. For example, the massive dependence on casual day labor set Apulia apart from the rest of the south of Italy. Nowhere else in the Mezzogiorno was the workforce so homogeneous or so comprehensively proletarianized. Moreover, a rigid sexual division of labor was one of the props of the social order, isolating half of the population in the home and removing them from contact with nascent bonds of class solidarity. The prevailing practice on the Latifundia was simply stated by the mayor of Altamura in 1875, when he reported that women are not employed in the cultivation of the land, either as day laborers or as salaried personnel. By contrast, in the more diversified economy of rural Calabria, gang labor embraced all groups of the family, men, women, and children, but working separately in their own gender segregated gangs. In Apulia, the farming separately, the farm workers were concentrated in towns, the so-called agro-cities, described by Snowden as classic company towns, where workers lived, without light or water, squeezed at the rate of 10 people to a single squalid, windowless room, five meters square, that served at once as living room, kitchen, bedroom, and lavatory. These desperately harsh conditions contrast interestingly with the Brasianti, on the massive Barocco estate in neighboring Calabria, rapidly accumulated in the early 19th century, who were less comprehensively proletarianized, that is, drawn from the local small peasantry, and even more strongly, of course, with the rest of the wage earners on that latifundo, who were integrated into the rudimentary networks of social security that Petrusowitz calls the estate's guarantee system, including, crucially, job security. Indeed, it is now clear that job security was a key factor in consolidating the labor forces of estates that needed a year-round supply of labor, unlike those in Apulia and more like the Baraco, the Baraco estate and sought to attract, worker, attract workers with credit, wage advances, land allotments and access to grazing rights or some combination of these. The classic form of this labor regime is surely the hacienda, but there are strong variants or homol homologues elsewhere, notably in Egypt and South Africa. The Hacienda was a commercial profit-seeking enterprise that comprised a labor force of full-time laborers attracted to the estate by advances. In Mexico, the Indians refused to work without these and integrated into its operations through a series of fringe benefits, if we can call them that, of which the most important were land parcels and or grazing rights. This core labor force was then supplemented by substantial numbers of seasonal workers, so that hacienda type estate systems generated a two-tiered labor force and a stratified labor market. The general form of exploitation characteristic of hacienda style estate systems is best described as labor tenancy. And there are two key points we need to make about it. First, as the great Mexican historian Silvio Zavala argued in a seminal paper from the 1940s, the Ganans were wage laborers, workers attracted to the, the hacienda by means of a voluntary contract. N uh, Zavala made this crucial point to show that the hacienda did not evolve out of the insom insomienda, as a whole tradition of Mexican politics and historiography suggested. In other words, the hacienda did not have feudal origins, even ones mediated by colonialism and presuppose the mobility of the worker. Second, although debt peonage is widely seen as the hallmark of the Latin American hacienda because it fits so neatly into the feudal stereotype, the fact of debt cannot be taken to imply bondage, as Alan Knight argued in a lucid paper 
To confuse debt with bondage is to ignore the compulsions that drove Indian workers into the hacienda in the first place. It was the predatory and often catastrophic event of colonialism and the cyclical crises that went with it that ensured that in New Spain, for example, the many stresses of the 16th and 17th centuries would work as inducements to Indians to seek employment in haciendas and in some instances to move completely from town to hacienda residence. As Gibson pointed out in his monumental book, The Aztecs Under Spanish Rule, the hacienda was less overtly coercive in its policies of labor recruitment than any of the antecedent institutions. In fact, Gibson produced a major gestalt switch in the understanding of the issue by reconceptualizing the debt as an advance of wages. It was impossible, one late 18th century writer stated, to find Indians who would work with a debt of only five pesos, at this time a legal limit. If an employer were to refuse to raise his offer over five pesos, the Indian would desert and move to another hacienda where conditions were more attractive. Here the emphasis is reversed from the conventional interpretation of debt labor, for it assumes relative freedom among the workers, whose objective was not to escape but to enlarge the indebtedness. In any case, the amount of the debt may be considered in some degree as a measure of the bargaining power of the worker. The relatively dense population of the Valley of Mexico may have reduced this bargaining power and accordingly reduced the amount of indebtedness and the role of peonage. Gibson's reversal of perspective in turn was the basis for the kind of distinctions that Alan Knight went on to make in, went on to make in an essay that breaks with the superficial similitude of debt to distinguish classic debt servitude from other more proletarian and certainly less coercive forms that are usually conflated with it. Knight's paper contains a brilliant description of the fiercely repressive form of capitalism that prevailed in late 19th century uh, Yucatan, where the boom in fiber production was met by a monocultural quasi-industrial hacienda regime based on extreme coercion, flogging, debt servitude, etc., but also financed to a great degree by New York brokers and the banks they borrowed from. As Wells points out, the expansion of the Hanequin industry was bound up with legal changes that stipulated that the peon who left work without paying the sums that he owed would be prosecuted before the courts. But Yucatan's classic debt servitude was part of a capitalist labor regime where it functioned to reinforce the internal mobility and flexibility of a tightly regulated labor force where workers were transferred between tasks and in general peace rated. And it is worth emphasizing that in Mexico anyway, these types of extreme coercion compar comparable to chattel slavery were more characteristic of quasi-industrial enterprises, such as those in timber and tobacco, than of the coffee plantations of Chiapas or the purely agricultural haciendas of central Mexico. In Prussia, where the export boom of the late 18th century was sustained initially by labor services and feudal bonds sharpened to create an effective labor system, the system already contained markedly capitalist features by which, by which Schisler means that the Prussian estate owners used their traditional Herrschaftsrechten for purely economic ends and the ensuing labor regime was one characterized above all by its hybridity, no longer feudal, but not purely capitalist either. The interesting feature in Schisler's account is that the modernization of the Prussian estates was financed by the money market, with mortgage companies encouraging the concentration of estates in the hands of magnates and large owners and deepening differentiation within the ranks of the landed class. By the 1860s, 1 1.5% of estates controlled 60% of the land area. As the demand for labor expanded, landlords settled labor, laborers on their estates as instin. The link between capitalist profitability and the new kinds of labor contract is explicit in the Thayer's advice that the use of insolute ins ins would help landowners reduce wages to offset the impact of low grain prices. The instrument, of course, was the Prussian counterpart of the labor tenant, and this is a good example of agrarian, agrarian depression, accel accelerating the rationalization of estates.
as the renovated landed elites of the early 19th century came to comprise a substantial layer of agra capitalistin and in the words of Hans Rosenberg, the Gutsaristocratie of the earlier period was transformed into a unified Unternehmerschicht by 1850. I'm so sorry. Rosenberg himself describes this reorganized shaft of the 19th century is a tightly controlled enterprise whose autocratic forms of governance meant that its workers were personally ruled by the Gutschern. If, if, if the East Elbian aristocracy was a key factor in the support for German fascism, as much as the Latifundisti of Apulia were in the rise of Italian fascism and its suppression of the farm workers' leagues, then the agrarian relations of these hybrid forms of capitalism have something to do, certainly with those political cultures and their undermining of the basis for a transition to true, to true democracy. At any rate, the capitalist manorialism of the Prussian estate was sufficiently distinct to count as one reasonably well-defined model of agrarian capitalism. Indeed, we all know that Lenin even dignified it with the general description, landlord capitalism. And again, as with Southern Mexico and its integration and internal international markets, East Elbia supplied much of the grain and wool consumed by Britain, implying here too that the hybrid forms of capital that dominated much of the countryside in the 19th century flourished best within the circuits of a rapidly expanding industrial capitalism. Gunder Frank's point surely was that their integration within these circuits conferred on countries like Mexico a different kind of capitalist history from any imagined archetype. The point is one that seems self-evident to me. Probably the best example of this is the transformation of the Egyptian countryside that was triggered in part by the growing British demand for cotton. As Roger Owen argued in his classic monograph, the large estates produced better cotton and obtained higher yields per acre. The collapse of the boom in the late 1860s caused widespread dispossession among the mass of the peasantry. The Fellahin fel, fel, lost over 300,000 fedans during Ismail's reign, with no comparable effect on the biggest landowners, who came to control roughly 50% of the land in private ownership by, by 1907. Owen published Cotton in the Egyptian Economy in 1969. Since then, both he and Alan Richards have used the work of Nahas and others to reconstruct the kind of labor organization that prevailed on those large estates. This was the Esba system, Egypt's version of labor tenancy, constructed around estate settlements that housed a year-round labor force of workers called Tamalia who were basically peasants who agreed to provide a regular amount of work on the, on the estate in exchange for the right to rent a small plot of land for their own use. This system had been used on the royal Jiftliks in the 1840s. Later, it became institutionalized with the creation of agricultural settle settlements known as izbas, in which the tenants were housed in mud dwellings grouped around the central stores and the residence of the owner. According to Richards, Tamalia labor was especially employed in cotton cultivation, and their parcels rotated with the crop rotation of the estate. In a seminal thesis, Nahas observed that in hiring workers on this basis, the estate had access to the labor of women and children as well, and described one contract by which each peasant family was required to supply an agreed number of workers for the owner's fields at a daily wage to be, to be determined in advance. Of course, the precise details of such arrangements varied between states, but the fact remains that the ESBA system was the most common mode of exploitation for large estates and expanded rapidly between the 1880s and the 1920s. It might seem paradoxical that it should be a third world country, Egypt, that best illustrates the purely capitalist rationality at work in the evolution and expansion of these enterprises. When two young French geographers, Lozac and Hug, students of Albert de Mangian, studied the landscapes of the Delta and the Fayum in the 1920s, basing this on 4,000 questionnaires to the fellas, 
they saw the Esbas concentrating peasant labor for more effective capitalist control. The Esbas were inseparable from the dense network of canals that spread through Lower Egypt in the late 19th century, and thus a product of land management policies that set out to restore the infrastructure of the country. But they were also typically the outcome of a new agrarian capitalism, capitalist settlements, as Hug called them, whose function was to facilitate closer surveillance of the workers and cut down on the time needed to travel in the fields or to the fields. And in a separate work published in the 1930s, Jean Lozak referred to the industrial, almost mathematical spirit behind the construction of these settlements. Ghislaine Alom has recently built on these conceptions to describe the Esbes as workers, villages, and points out that the larger estates could hold several such compounds. The parallels with industrial manufacturing are striking at the formal level as well. Isbes were rural versions of the workers' compound conceived in the experiments of French civil engineers linked to the St. Simonians and took off in the 1880s when an Ali Mubarak drafted a legal framework which laid out in precise detail the technical prescriptions for the width of roads, sanitation, building materials, and so forth. Strongly influenced by French legislation, promulgated in the aftermath of Blanqui and Villermin's social study of workers in large industry. The law was initially conceived for workers' suburbs in the cities. It is hardly surprising then that 19th, early 20th century Egypt should form such a solid base for the critique of the feudal stereotypes suggested in the work of Roger Owen and Alan Richards. This critique has Lat Latin American parallels, of course, and South African ones as well. And it is unlikely that many Marxists today would still want to adhere to the ruined orthodoxy of feudal or semi-feudal modes of production, but this critique has left a theoretical vacuum we still need to address. The key fact is that in the estate systems described or alluded to above, including, including those in parts of Italy which were based on sharecropping, the peasants had no claim whatsoever to the land, and sharecroppers and estate workers could be dismissed at any time. Eviction was, in the words of one Tuscan aristocrat, the sole means of restoring discipline among the sharecropping masses, and its suppression was a key demand in the series of largely spontaneous sharecropper strikes that broke out in central Tuscany in 1919. In fact, it has been suggested that because the socialists wanted to abolish misadria, rather than reform or regulate it, the Red Pact of 1920 allowed evictions on fair grounds. <clears throat> these including, these, oh shit, these including the takeover of the farm for the owner's own use and transformation of the system of administration to capitalist methods, both amounting presumably to the more advanced forms of capitalist management which they preferred. The point of all this is that eviction would have been no punishment for a serf, which takes us back to the general distinction I drew in chapter 8 between bondage, more characteristic of the post-Roman and medieval West, <clears throat> and landlessness, more typical of the East. Hybrid forms of agrarian capitalism of the later 18th and 19th centuries were built on the dispossession and landlessness of the peasantry more than its bondage but always ready to use coercion to ensure minimal disruption to the supply of labor. For capitalists, this is perfectly, perfectly rational behavior, as long as it does not jeopardize the social mobility of labor, that is, the ability of workers in general to move between villages and estates, or between different parts of the countryside, including the estates themselves. There is no evidence that even the most extreme forms of debt servitude ever had this particular effect of restricting the mobility of social labor or undermining the fluidity of the labor market. On the contrary, even enterprises that made regular use of wage advances and sought to retain labor in stronger ways used substantial numbers of seasonal workers, as Mertens's study of the Mexican haciendas shows at length. In short, at least one sense of, of hybridity is this coupling of proletarianization and compulsion of an uprooted landless peasantry and the peculiar forms of domination. The whole battery of devices, including legal ones used to ensure its submission 
But going back to Egypt for a moment, there is another aspect of hybridity worth noting, one that I alluded to briefly at the start. I referred there to aristocratic mentalities and noted the example of the South Italian latifundisti as typical of this mixed behavior. In Egypt, the groups who embodied or personified the agrarian capitalism of the 19th and early, earlier 20th century were even more extreme in their diversity, thoroughly atypical of the canonical model of agrarian capitalism that many Marxists still subscribe to. The Egyptian capitalists who ruled the expanding countryside of the Esbas and gained the most from the massive dispossession of the Felas were a small elite of government officials, including army officers, merchants, and of course, members of the ruling family, coupled with numerous land companies controlled by foreign and local investors, themselves from a huge diversity of ethnic backgrounds. Now the formalist orthodoxy of a pure agrarian capitalism homogenizes both capital and labor, ignoring the legacies that shape the real evolution of capitalism in the countryside, above all, the backgrounds from which the capitalists themselves emerged, and the striking anomalies of their existence. Frank understood that the history of world capitalism was not an endless rehearsal of the same transition but a considerably more complex process as totalizations generally are. To sum up, hybrid forms of agrarian capitalism is a possible description of wage labor enterprises characterized by one, low levels of capitalization relative to industry, but not immune to modernization, much less to the use of modern technology and machinery. Two, asymmetric labor contracts or coercive labor regimes usually but not always, and three, considerable flexibility in the use of labor and systems of estate management. They were quintessentially products of liberalism, insofar as it was the liberal atomism of the 19th century that prized open markets for land and labor on historically unprecedented scales, both increasing the mobility of labor and sanctioning the use of coercion against workers. The expansion of these labor systems against the background of a growing industrial demand for crops like cotton, sugarcane, rice and tobacco, and dozens of others, is surely a sufficient and sufficiently strong explanation of the integration of bound labor into world capitalism, the seeming paradox of which generated the debate between Frank and Laclau. The point here is that it would be wrong to think of the labor systems themselves as modes of production since they were constructed and driven by capitalists or by a combination of capitalist classes who themselves emerged from very different historical backgrounds. The trouble with Laclau's response to Frank was that he systematically confused relations of production with forms of exploitation of labor. This hardly needs to be demonstrated as it runs through almost every page of his critique and leads him in the postscript that he added six years later to a theoretical position that asserts the very opposite of Marx's own conception. Laclau summed up his view as follows. The concept of world capitalist system is the nearest approximation to the concrete which, I merely, which a merely economic analysis permits. And if what we have asserted in this essay is correct, it cannot be derived from the concept of capitalist mode of production but must be constru constructed by starting from a theoretical study of possible articulations of the different modes of production. By contrast, Marx maintained and tells us in the Grand Race, the tendency to create the world market is directly given in the concept of capital itself. Before a synthesis is possible, historians will have to map the various early modern paths to agrarian capitalism in more detail, working not at the national but at the regional or subnational level. It is not obvious that there are national paths of transition, and it seems more useful, therefore, to concentrate on trajectories of accumulation of the kind alluded to in passing in the last few pages of this chapter. Whether these were also transitions, and if so, to what exactly, can obviously only be established once we have clear descriptions or reconstructions of the different trajectories themselves. In Capitalism from Above and Capitalism from Below, Terry Byers concludes by underlining the diversity in the forms taken by capitalist transformation. I take this as a claim about both agrarian questions, two as well as three, but if so, it means that Lenin's two paths cannot be a sufficiently strong basis to guide future work. 
trajectories of accumulation is a more flexible concept in the sense that the chronological spans are variable. Different trajectories can be at work simultaneously, and the outcome is not predetermined.